All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I um, I don't say this as a joke. I mean it, and I say it every time Sam asks me to fill in. But I am um, grateful and thankful that you show up knowing he isn't going to be here, and that you have Seb, and it's me. And I do appreciate that. And I was really excited about. Oh, it's probably been 45 days since he asked me to do this portion, and um, this is a fun section. Uh, in the Bible and in the book of Romans. It's a section I'm very passionate about and love. And so I was really excited to get the opportunity to to be in this portion that we're going to be today, which are the last three verses of chapter 9 and all the way through chapter 10. Um, before we get started, though, I want to preface class with a couple things. Sam mentioned last week that within the Bible, there are various doctrines that have Hold, ha, people have different views on different things. And as long as you're within this group, you're within biblical Christianity regardless of your view. If you veer outside of that, it gets a little dangerous. Okay? I want you to know that I am going to lead this with the view that Paul is teaching, and not only Paul, but the Bible as a whole, is teaching that Israel and the church are not the same thing. Okay? That is my view. Um, so that's my perspective. Essentially, what you have here, this is a, it's not dead on this, but uh, chapters 9, 10, 11 would essentially be Israel's past, present, and future. That is, that is the perspective and view that I hold. That's how I'm going to lead through today. And so I want you to, to know that going, going forth. Um, I haven't been in class with everybody in here, so I always go over my two rules whenever I'm the liaison, if you will, which is, number one, there's no dumb questions. Um, Everybody in here is probably thinking the same thing if you're wondering it or has thought the same thing. I, you know, the only way we can learn and iron can sharpen iron and we can grow in fellowship is if somebody's willing to ask. So please do not hesitate. And number two, and probably the most important thing I will say the entire hour is I do not know everything. Um, I would love to. I want to. I spend so much time in study, prayer, asking God to, that the Spirit would give me discernment to know what's biblical, what is not. And, uh, but I, I don't know everything, only one person does, and I'm not him. So, um, as long as you guys are good with that, I'll open us in prayer, and uh, we'll, get, uh, we'll get going. Father, I'm so thankful, um, man, to be here, uh, to be in this group, Lord, to uh, people, brothers and sisters who love you, uh, who want to serve you, who want to learn, have understanding, want to grow. And I'm, I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to, to be here. I pray, Lord, that it would not be me that would speak, but it would be you. And that you would bless this time and uh, your spirit move amongst us. And uh, we love you and we thank you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So uh, not to be redundant, but uh, I want to summarize chapters 1 through 8 again. I thought Sam did a wonderful summary last week. Uh, and it, so it's, this is not because I thought he did a poor job. It was a wonderful summary. But I want to set us up for where I'm going and where we're going today. So in 1 through 8, right, uh, you have Paul's expounding upon mankind's sin. And mankind's sin leads to all men's condemnation. And in chapter 1, we had Gentile guilt, chapter 2, Jewish guilt, and he summarizes it in 3, 3, 23, with all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But, right, you start getting to 4, 5, 6, but Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, by the grace of God, has allowed us newness of life by placing our faith in him. And... And that is through his death and resurrection. I want to read uh, some of the favorites that I have. I want to read Romans 5, 1 through 2, and I'll read them to you. I'm reading out of the New King James Version for anybody who wonders. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And 8, 9, and 10. <clears throat> you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So you have, throughout the entire book of Romans, you have the 
the righteousness of God that gets revealed by condemnation. That's the first few. Justification by faith, which is the next few. You have sanctification, and Paul talks a little bit that six and seven and eight. You have election, which is nine, ten, and eleven, and you have the newness of life, which is how the the book finishes up. So, everybody has ridden on a roller coaster or knows what a roller coaster does. I'm assuming <laughs> that's kind of what Paul does in Romans. That's how I view Romans. So if you if you, we start we we leave the safety of the whatever, and you're supposed to keep your hands and feet inside the vehicle at all times. And Paul, yeah, Paul, Paul starts coming up at the beginning of one, okay? And you have this wonderful salutation. Remember, Dan taught this, if you remember when Dan was here, that he longed to visit this church at Rome. And their faith had been heard of all over the world. And he wanted to be edified by them. He wanted to share and, and impart spiritual gifts in them and share in that fellowship. And so you, you get over that, you know, it's like at the fair when my kids ride the baby thing. It's just a quick thing, and then you're back up and over. And, but unfortunately, Paul keeps going down for the next basically two and a half chapters. When you get into the end of one, and that was the last time I was with you, as we looked at why the Gentiles were guilty. And two, Jews are guilty. And then three, as we've already seen, all are guilty and fallen short of the glory of God. But after we kind of go down, Paul kind of puts the brakes on and we kind of start going back up in four and, and in five and in six when we realize that though we are all guilty by our sins, that by faith we are saved and it's not of works, right? And so you have this peace with God. That's, kind of, that's actually the title of chapter five, I believe, if I remember right, probably in most Bibles. That's probably actually what it says, peace with God. So in due time... Christ came and died for the ungodly. That's what chapter 5 is all about. And then in 6 is, okay, great. So our previous lives were not that great. We're all guilty, but Christ died for us. We accept him by faith. And then chapter 6 is, okay, so do we use that faith as an excuse to go on sinning, right? Paul says, no, absolutely not. So you have this. And then in 7, the, the real reality sets in. And that although we've been justified, right? And that word justified is such a powerful word in the Greek. You've judicially been declared righteous through the lens of Jesus Christ. But, and that's how God views you when you accept Jesus as your Savior. And so, but, but Paul struggles through chapter 7. At least the, at least the latter half of 7, right? And you have this, there's, there's actually two prominent views here as well that, Paul is talking about and describing his pre-conversion, and I disagree with that very strongly. Uh, I think Paul, as he was writing this, is describing his post-conversion, his life after accepting Christ, that why he's been justified, there's this constant sanctification process happening where you've been justified, which means you've been freed from the penalty of your sin, but sin is still present. We're not being glorified. This is a sanctification process. And Paul is just tug of war happening, right? Where I, The thing I hate, that in which I do, and the thing I want to do, that in which I cannot do, I can relate to that. And, and so I, I hold the view very strongly that Paul's talking about, no, I, I love Jesus, but I still struggle. I'm still a human. I'm still a man. That's when the sin, struggle with sin becomes very real because you're so much more aware of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and he goes on and talks about that the law, you know, I wouldn't even have known covetousness if the law said do not covet and this realization of what the law does. But then we get to eight and the roller coaster starts making this climb to a peak. And he goes on and he talks about having the spirit. Uh, you know, he battles this wages, but thank God the spirit of God lives in and, we, and we, he demonstrates that the Spirit intercedes on our behalf, and we don't even know what to pray. And, I mean, Paul alone talks about two-thirds of the Trinity in his epistles that intercede for us. Christ Jesus is interceding you and the Holy Spirit. I'll take my chances at 67%, but the Bible as a whole teaches all three of them are on your side. That's pretty good. But who is he speaking to? The other third. Right. So. Say what you said again slower. That The two-third deal? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Paul in 8 teaches that even when you don't know what to pray, the Spirit of God lives in you. The Holy Spirit will actually pray on your behalf, and he intercedes on your behalf. And, Christ, and Paul elsewhere teaches that Christ intercedes on our behalf, and Hebrews talks about that as well. So you have two-thirds of the Trinity that the New Testament teaches intercedes on your behalf, fighting for you. And then the Bible as a whole, I mean, God the Father is obviously in there as well. Thank you. And then 
Sam did a great job elaborating on the end of eight. It, what a mar it, it is poetic. It's so poetic, and it's wonderful, and it's marvelous. And you reach this peak of nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing. But the roller coaster can't always keep going up. And you see in 9, and I'm going to summarize 9. We're not going all the way back through it, but the tone changes very quickly. And we looked at that last week. And, and Paul, Paul goes on, he says, I tell you the truth in Christ. He's trying to get the point across that I'm not lying. My conscience bearing witness. The Holy Spirit is a witness. I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. I wish I were accursed, he says. Paul wishes he, even him and himself could be separated from Christ for the sake of the Israelites. That's what he's teaching here. And so, he, why does he have that sorrow? Because they rejected their Messiah. And he goes on in, in 9 to explain that theirs are the, you know, although they rejected that God has not cast away Israel forever, theirs are the promises, theirs were the patriarchs, theirs are the covenants, theirs was the ancestry of Christ. And I want to say real quickly that, and it, we'll look more to this when we get to chapter 10, is that, you know, coming through my view is that you have right now, uh, the word Advent, if you hear me use the word Advent, it just means coming for anybody who might not know. It just means coming. So we're in the inter-Advent age currently. It is the time between Christ's first and second coming. We all know Christ came already. He's yet to come again. We won't get into that debate on when and where he's coming. But within the inter-Advent age, you have the church age, and that's where we are right now. And Jew and Gentile alike, if you believe in Jesus as your Messiah, you're a member of the church. Um, so, little tidbit there. Uh, further into 9, uh, Paul puts God's sovereignty on full display. Uh, he talks about the children of promise, right? Isaac, not through Ishmael. Sam did a great job explaining that. Jacob, I have loved. Esau, I have hated. And we see that God's promises cannot fail. And any which way God chooses, he will be glorified. And the example used, I believe in verse 17, yes, it says, For the scripture says, Pharaoh, for this purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. And God uses rulers, good or evil, to glorify himself. And in Exodus, and I think this was briefly talked about last week as well, if I recall, Exodus, it says that Pharaoh hardened Pharaoh's heart. And it says that numerous times, and then it also says God, hold up, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. I'm going to insert my one plug into this class right now, and this is that predestination topic. It, we didn't even scratch the surface last week, and you really can't in an hour anyway. Uh, but for those of you who like talking about that or want to learn more about that, I would love to do that with you, and I would encourage you to consider taking uh, the Anchored Faith class that is hopefully going to be happening every single spring leading up to Easter. And we will talk about that in depth, and we will look at biblical arguments for both. And, and um, So anyway, that, that's, that's that. But, but Paul, that's what Paul's demonstrating in 9 is, is God's sovereignty. And God will be glorified no matter what. So through Israel's rejection... God is currently glorified through the church. In the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, it says that the Israelites were light to the nations. They were God's chosen people. Okay, They were provoked Gentiles, really, to jealousy. They were sanctified people of God. And God, through the, in the Old Testament, was glorified through Israel. And we talked a little bit last week about the differences in the remnant. You have, I think Sam used, uh, if I remember correctly, national Israel and spiritual Israel, I believe, is how he wrote it on the board, and, and I, don't, I don't disagree with that at all. I would just say national Israel and believing Israel, there's two remnants there. But nonetheless, uh, right now, through the church, and, but there will be a future time again in which Israel will be the primary vessel in which God is glorified. And that does not mean that Gentiles will not be partakers of that blessing and will not be glorified. It just means that the primary vessel in which it was promised to will be Israel. Okay? So, we have summarized to the point of where we got. Has anybody got anything before we get into 30? I timed this about 18 times before, because I always, <laughs> I prepare as if nobody's going to talk. I, I was telling Brian this on Thursday. <laughs> you have to. You have to prepare as if people aren't going to. So, I can do this in 35 minutes, but it's me just humming along. So, you just got to stop me. And we, we may just get done early and everybody can go have donuts and coffee. I don't know, but 
feel free to send. All right, let's get to 30. Chapter 9, verse 30. I'm going to read 30 through 33. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness have obtained righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion, another word for Jerusalem, a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. But whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So you have this perspective switch where we just looked at Paul teaching God's sovereignty, you know, in the first 29 verses of 9. But now in the last three verses of 9, we have the flip side of the coin and human responsibility is on full display, right? And remember me saying that, that it is my view in the predestination realm that God hardening Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh hardening his own heart are not mutually exclusive statements. And I'll, I'll leave it at that for another class at another time. But verse 32 Paul explains why Israel did not obtain righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as the law. And he quotes the passage from Isaiah. The stumbling stone is who? Christ. Christ, absolutely. And they rejected him. And they, they got all hung up on their idea of the Messiah and their own perspective versus what they were promised. But whoever believes on him will never be put to shame is... The ones who did and the ones who will are forever going to be with, with Jesus. I like that scripture where it says that whoever falls on Christ will be broken. Remember, he falls on dust. Mm -hmm. When you fall on Christ, you are broken. You better be broken because you realize what you are and who you are. Yeah. But you don't want him to fall on you. It's over if he falls on you. Yeah, Sam, I, I, I liked kind of how Sam talked about justice today. That was, uh, it was good. Um, that was, uh, it was something to think about, uh, how he worded it, how he, how he did it. I, I like that. All right, so <clears throat> Jews today, and I, I just say this before we get into 10, any, it says, and whoever believes in him will be put to shame. There are many Jews today, people who can trace, trace their ancestry all the way back to the patriarchs. Um, and, Although they are ethnic Jew, they are members of the church. And so, and we're going to see that a little bit in 10. Um, and I'm, I'm ready to go into 10 if, if nobody has anything on the end of 9. I think what we're going into squashes replacement theology as well. Well, I would agree. But again, um, people hold to, to yeah. different things there, and I'll, I'll stay on the straight and narrow. Um, all right, I'm going to read... Um, 1 through 11, 10, 1 through 11, that's where, we're, that's where we're looking at. Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preached. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Amen. And Sam, Sam even incorporated that into Ephesians today, because Paul teaches similar things throughout many of his epistles. But you have this overall conclusion... <laughs> The summary in the first 11 verses here of Paul again saying it isn't by works, it's by faith through or through faith by grace. And chapter 10 starts very similarly to the way chapter 9 does. And Paul's desire and his prayer that his brethren would be saved. And, and it, it would seem odd 
that he would be talking about the church potentially and not a distinct group of people and, and continue doing that for two chapters in a row, this, this constant opening of his, tr- of his sorrow. But Paul says that their zeal, they had zeal, they had knowledge, right? But it wasn't according to, to Christ. It wasn't according to righteousness. It was according to their own, their own works, their you own effort. should know he would. Yeah. He was, he was right up there on the best of them. He was. He absolutely was. And, and Sam, Sam hit this day, and I, this is a quote that I, I love from uh, uh, Dr. Norman Geisler, and Sam um, said it in his own words today, but you know, essentially what Paul's saying is that head apprehension is not the same as heart appropriation. So all they, they knew, they couldn't move from this to through. And that's, uh, that's ultimately what held them up. When they asked for sign after sign, he gave them sign after sign, and they still wouldn't believe. Still wouldn't believe. I mean, the ultimate Lazarus from the dead. I mean, who has ever raised right in front of them? And, and some they, of them even said, uh, "Who could this be but the Son of God?" Right. And, and then what was when it got reported to the uh, to the authorities? We're going to have to kill him and Lazarus. We're going to have to get rid of both of them yeah. because of this. Yeah, it's it's. That is uh, Kate. Every time we read her case, it's just, I just don't understand how could they still not get it. Even the twelve, even the twelve struggled and, and talked amongst themselves. When we went through the Book of Mark last year, he did miracle after miracle, and they said, "Who is this?" They, they still just couldn't get it. Um, in verse in verse four, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now Christ is the end of the law in the sense of it being the basis of relationship between us and God. It isn't that the law is worthless, right? Christ said, I didn't come to abolish the law. He fulfilled it. Fulfilled it. And he goes on in 5 and 6 to talk about, uh, for Moses says, uh, the man who does these things shall live by them. So the law is a direct reflection of who God is. The law in and of itself is not bad. It's holy. And But if you want to follow it, if that's what you want to put all your beans in, then you better be able to cross every... or Cross every T and dot every I. Crossing an, or crossing an I and dotting a T would be interesting. Um, and I want to read uh, Galatians. Okay, and I keep this in mind that when Paul wrote the epistle, Galatians, it is eight years prior to when he wrote Romans. Okay, so in Galatians three, starting in verse ten, I'm going to read ten through fourteen. Paul says. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith. The man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So Paul already said eight years earlier that, one, you can't do it. You're not going to be able to do it. It's by faith alone. And Galatians, and I don't remember if we talked about this last week or not, or, or I'm trying to, maybe it was Thursday at, at the men's, at the men's, at some, I felt like somebody, maybe it was Dean talking about Judaizers, and, that, and that's what Paul's addressing in, the, in Galatians, is this, oh, it's works plus this, or it's not just faith, it's, it's always incorporating works of some sort, and that's just not true, and Paul makes that so clear, and the book of James, one, probably one of my Easily one of my favorite books in the entire Bible, the half-brother of Jesus. James is saying, show me your faith without works, and I'll show you a faith that's dead. Well, what's he saying? Works He's saying, follow. huh? Works follow. Yes. You can't help but do the works. That's right. Just just like in, in 9 and nine through 11, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture said... Whoever believes in will not put to shame. This is not contradictory that it is with the confession of the mouth, which is a work or could be classified as a work. No, he's saying the inward change that Jesus does on the heart 
should should outwardly, and, and Sam talked about this today too, the whole out, the way you live, the way you talk, the way you, your prayer life, your spiritual, everything in you. The results. Yes, it is, is a direct result of, and is a manifestation of what happened inside of you, what Christ did to the inside of you. And that's what he's saying. The heart, and then the confession is the natural continuation through that. And that's the same thing James says in, in the book of, in the book of James, right? That because of that faith, why would you want to stay in the way you did? Why, why would you, because of what he did for you, you know, your body a living sacrifice, right? That whole concept. And so, just beautiful, beautiful it's, stuff. It's not the cause of your salvation, but it is an effect. Of right. Yes. I think that's very important for the youth today um, and what they're projected to on their phones and on mm -hmm. uh, the internet, they see all these celebrities uh, today that are coming out and saying they're Christian, but then you give them a little bit of time and you still see what they promote. They're half, they're hardly dressed at all, but they have a cross on their neck. Yeah. And uh, you know, so I'm not going to go too deep into it, but uh, you know, just because you see a cross on someone's neck, or just because they say they're a Christian, you know, um, you need to really question the fruits. Yeah, Christianity is probably about the most watered down term. In the world today, unfortunately. Yeah, just in case Christians. Yes. Yep. I'm just trying to suck the youth into uh, deception. I agree. And I feel like I've even found some people who try to use the term Christ follower instead of Christian mm. to kind of separate it from yeah. what we let the term Christian become. Mm. I say we, I don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I even like the, being in Christ. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I'm a, Absolutely, it's a. Um, I tried to do that myself, call myself a follower of Christ instead of a Christian. Mm -hmm. But then you know, you just hear Paul refer to us as Christians, so I can't get away from the body of Scripture. So that's sure. Yes. Also yeah. Fact. So let's look at um, let's look at twelve and thirteen. Paul says, "For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, or Gentile, non-Jew." For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So one of Israel's big problems, right, and, and Paul's already demonstrated, they, theirs were the promises, theirs were the covenants, theirs were the this and the that and that. And they wanted to keep salvation to themselves. They, they didn't think it was for the Gentiles. They thought salvation was for themselves. Not for and, the dogs. Right. And here he says, no, 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 no. In Christ, there is no distinction. And I don't think that Paul's primary intent here was to give a description of the church. But nonetheless, we can, take, we can, we can see that it is at least unintentionally taught as well. And that's how the church ages. There's no distinction between Jew and, Jew and Greek. And we already talked about that. But what... The primary thing here is that Israel thought, you know, that the Gentiles were not ever going to be good enough. They weren't God's chosen people, and, and salvation wasn't to them. And, and Paul is saying, no, 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 no. It is for anyone and everyone who calls the name my son. And uh, he moves into 14 and 15. And he says, how then shall they call on him whom they have not believed, and how... Shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are, unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good or bring glad tidings of good things. Now, I told you one of the most important things I would say all day is that I don't know everything. And I want to give you a prime example here. And this may be really black and white for you, and I, I struggle with it. And I have studied Greek. Um, Dan Hankey has studied Greek for over 20 years. He's a brilliant man. Uh, him, myself, and Logan Kuhn all discussed this in great length last week, and uh, it is, I, I don't have an answer. Many of your Bibles probably start at 16, and there's probably a new header where Paul's, uh, there's going to be a shift in exactly who he's talking about. It's, it's going to be no doubt that he is now addressing Israel again. In 14, the they, I and, and for those of you who have been in my class, you know my number one pet peeve is, is taking things out of context. Context, context, context. It's as important as location, location, location if you're a realtor. But the they here in the Greek is very hard to determine. In Greek, uh, Greek words have personal endings. So if I wanted to say, 
I come, you know, or you come, or something like that. It's two words in English. But in Greek, it's the how the <coughs> word ends. So, erkomai means I come. The Greek here does not give us exactly who he's talking about. Now, the good thing is, is and, and here's the three options. He's either talking about everybody, Jew and Gentile alike. He's talking about Gentiles, or he's talking about Israel. The important thing to note is that it does not matter who he's talking about. It does not change the doctrine of 14 and 15 at all. And the importance of what Paul is trying to drive home here is the importance of the gospel being proclaimed. It is our job to take Christ to all people. It is not our job to bring everybody to Christ. There's a big difference. And Paul quotes Isaiah Again, as he does many times, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. But isn't it interesting, as we're in the book of Ephesians on Sunday mornings, when we get to chapter 6, when we talk about the armor of God, what does Paul say that the feet should be fitted with the readiness of the shoes of peace gospel? And so, it's the importance of the gospel. And Paul, in chapter 1, uh, and I believe it's verse 16... He's, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, who is the power of God, the base for everyone who believes, the Jew first and also for the Greek. And, and in 15, he says, So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So it doesn't matter if you're an unbeliever or a believer, the power of the gospel message will bring you to your knees every time. And Paul is writing right, this epistle to the church at Rome. He's writing to believers, yet he couldn't wait to preach the gospel to them. Saved people. And so 14 and 15, if, if you take anything out of 14 and 15, you take out how important it is to be ready to share the gospel with anybody and everybody at any given moment. And I think the word share is extremely important because most of us do not feel <clears throat> equipped to preach. But all of us should feel equipped to share. Mm -hmm. And if we're not, that should cause us to get into fellowship with other believers and ask questions and be encouraged and challenged. Yeah. And we need the world for the opportunity. We just there's not, there's our opportunities to share all around us. Mm -hmm. We just let God open the door for us. Well I liked what you said about looking for opportunity and praying that God will open certain doors because again that goes back to this whole with the heart one believes, with the mouth one confesses, and this in, inward change should, you should, you know, when something great happens at work, or something, you know, if one of you won the lottery, or had a million dollars put in your account, I guarantee we'd come in here and you'd be, you'd be telling everybody about it. Something great happened to you, and you want to share it, and why would why would anybody want to keep the gospel to themselves? Yes, sir. So they. So Jew, they. Jew and Gentile. Possibly. Possibly. Why wouldn't it be? That's what I'm saying. Sure why what, wouldn't it be? What I'm saying is, when you look at the Greek, there's a definite shift in 16 that we're about to get into. When you look at the Greek, I made the argument last week to Dan, and not really argument, but the question is, because he is much better at Greek than I am. Uh, I'm trying to get to his level, but he's had a long head start. And then it's just, it's inconclusive. It, it just, maybe it is. But again, it doesn't matter which it doesn't matter if it's all if it's one or the other, it does not matter. It changes nothing on what Paul what the point Paul's trying to drive home to. And I, I tend to agree that it's both. I just don't see how it could be one or the other. Well, either way, I mean, you know, again, well, it, it's it's the good news is there's only one gospel in that there's it's Christ has come for salvation. Yeah. But as you said at the beginning, the separation is because but for a Jew, it means, and for a Christian, it means. Mm. For a Christ, for us Gentiles, it means heaven with God forever. A Jew says, heaven, oh no, next year, Jerusalem. Mm. Because they've been promised this kingdom on this earth. Yeah. And that kingdom will be fulfilled because God is a, not a liar. He, it's a promise. Agreed. But so it, 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 to them, it means a little bit different, but it's still the same. That's why when <clears throat> Paul... When, excuse me, when Peter on the day of Pentecost and they said, what shall we do? He didn't say, he didn't mention the cross. Mm. Repent, believe that Jesus is Messiah and you're baptized in his name. While us, for, for, for us Christians, it means a little different because it, it's a kingdom we've been promised different than theirs. 
But the gospel is a gospel, and it's the good news of Christ for both, no matter yeah. what the, the happens afterwards or what, what what promises is fulfilled, whether it's a heavenly kingdom or an earthly kingdom. Agreed. I think it's important that we recognize not only what what God's word says but, and what does it mean, but also what does it mean to me to, mm -hmm. to make application. Yes. And what am I going to do about it? Well, over and over again, Jews and Gentiles, you know, Paul is saying in chapter 9 and then again in chapter 10, he's referring to the idea of anyone, anyone right. who trusts in Jesus will never be put to shame. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you referred back to the, the 16th uh, verse of the first chapter. You know, for I am not ashamed yeah. of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation of Everyone who believes, yeah. first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. I just won the lottery, I'm saved. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. the application, I think, for us in 2022 is we are not to be ashamed. Mm. We are to be talking about who Jesus is yeah. in our lives. We are to be witnessing to other people, not in a pushy kind of way, but as opportunities come to us, we need to recognize them and then say what mm. needs to be said. Mm. When it, what's that saying too? That, uh, that um, for some people you're the only Bible they'll ever read. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there's but there's some like you mentioned a while ago that aren't as educated in their walk as with, with Christ at the moment. They might need room to grow. And I don't think that they're ashamed. I think they're just uneducated and fearful to lead someone astray by the lack of knowledge that they're in right now. You know what I mean? Because that seed hasn't been watered to the effect to go out and disciple. Mm -hmm. we have to understand our role is to lead them to Christ it's their choice one of the most brutal times of my life my brother told me my, I would never speak to my dad again he would never hear he was a product of the Great Depression and the Second World War, and he was a very hard man. And I never took the time to talk to him about Jesus. I made the decision for him instead of allowing him to reject me and reject the Word of God. And that's something we all have to understand. Jesus was rejected over and over again and is rejected every second of every day. But we, he still loves us enough to give us a choice and we have to love others enough because that's one of the great commandments is to love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. To allow them to say, no, I'm not interested. <clears throat> and that may change. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what, what soil. If anybody wants a challenge, go to a educated rabbi or any Jew that knows uh, their scripture and try to convert them to Christianity. That's a challenge. And I don't think <coughs> if, if Paul had come to this, if Jesus hasn't, uh, didn't uh, step in you know, and lead the way, probably not. You know, it's, if you've ever listened to an uh, educated Jew, they are very, very stuck in the Old Testament, and uh, that's that's a challenge because they mm -hmm. see us as we, you know, so we talk to you Mormons or Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witnesses as butchering Scripture. Well, you know, how do you think they see us as? You know, complete, sure. Complete blasphemy is yeah. what they see us as. Because theirs is a worldly kingdom. Yes. You know, and ours is a spiritual kingdom. That's right. Yeah. Yes. I, I want to build on what Brian said um, just, just real quickly. This is going to sound like a commercial, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, last Wednesday, the senior ministry had the primetime luncheon, and the uh, woman who spoke uh, was raised in a Jewish home and became a Christian through a uh, sorority Bible study when she was in college. And bottom line on the whole thing, Brian, is that there were four people. Now, this is a senior ministry. There were four people who indicated that they prayed Jesus Christ. 
Mm. There were people last Wednesday. Wow. Three of three of them were from Milltown. Mm. Oh, wow. Two wow. were older people, and one was the transportation person. Wow. Yeah. So we, I agree. We cannot give up on people. We cannot assume yeah. that people know. Yeah. Yeah. Because often they don't. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Good stuff. That. Yeah. yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. So uh, 16 and through 18 is the next section we're going to, and again, I'll just keep reading. Um, Paul says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they, who's they? Israel. Have not heard? Yes, indeed. <laughs> I was like, man, my voice is starting to sound yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's listening to two sermons at once here. <laughs> their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. So, again, you have the, the right, the oracles of God were given to the Jews as demonstrated in chapter 2. The promises, the covenants, the Messiah was prophesied to be coming to them, but not only that, that also in the Old Testament, you can find prophecy that Israel would reject the Messiah. And he's referencing the Isaiah quote as a messianic prophecy. The Isaiah 53 is all about Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful, wonderful, if you would go read that later. Um, and again, it wasn't that they didn't know, right? He talked about they had zeal, they had knowledge, they understood. There's where the, I mean... And at that time, especially in the in the Pharisaical community, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, such and such, the knowledge would have been undisputed. And even Paul says, "I, I was I was advanced many among my I think, but but they had blind. There was the veil, right? And they couldn't see. It wasn't according to Jesus. They didn't accept him. And Paul finishes in eighteen with a quote from Psalms. Okay, their sound has gone out to all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. Now think about this." Because Paul, if you take this at face value, Paul's saying that the gospel had already reached the end of the world. But we know that is not true. Paul was longing to continue to move west, even to evangelize Spain at the time of writing this letter. He is not saying that all people on all four corners of the earth, if you will, no, I don't believe the earth is flat, neither does the Bible teach it, but the four corners of the earth, the the that all people had heard the gospel, but what he is demonstrating is that Israel, in the context of Israel had zero excuse, because theirs were the prophets, theirs were the prophecies, theirs was the, the Messiah came to them, kingdom of God was offered, Matthew 23, oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, yet you were not willing, okay, so each is responsible for hearing and receiving in and of themselves. And that's what Paul is talking about. Israel has no excuse for their current state and their rebellion. And now we go 9, 19 through 21, get to the end here. But I say, did Israel not know? First Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. Who's he talking about? Gentiles. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So you have the Deuteronomy 32 quote. You have more Isaiah quote in uh, 65, 1 and 2 here to finish the thing. And, and you have just God's providence, God's omniscience on full display here. He foretold Israel's rejection. He knew it wasn't wasn't plan B, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a surprise to God. And all day long, he says, I have stretched out my hands. God's willingness that his people would all come to faith. And even though he knew that they wouldn't, he longed for them to. And the disobedience, why are they disobedient? Because they rejected it, Christ. That's all that it took. They're disobedient because they rejected Jesus as the Messiah. A lot of people don't realize that you really have about the 40 years. They left mm. Egypt. They went right to the promised land. They were going right in. Yep. They sent the spies in. Mm -hmm. But they rejected the two and listened to the ten 
And then they then they spent the 40 years because they would not believe. Disbelief after everything he did right in front of them. The yep. pillar, the, the whole works. And they just, we can't do it. Yep. Well, he didn't ask we to do it. They couldn't even wait for they couldn't even wait for him <laughs> he, to get down. To he the said, mat. "I'll send the hornets yeah. after him. You don't really have to do anything. Just go right in and take over the groves and and all the trees and but believe." Yeah, it's kind of like on their on their path to Israel from Egypt, though they moaned and groaned the whole time. Right. Moses, why did you lead us here? We were eating yeah. back there as slaves. Yeah. It's kind of like what a lot of Christians do today is when we come to Christ. You know, uh, we didn't we didn't uh, get the. Uh, Prosperity gospel blessings. Mm. So we question, well, why did I even come? You know, what I was all I was all right, you know, in my own sins, you know what I mean? So I think a lot of people fall off that way as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. I think sometimes we read this and we think, oh, this part's this part's about Israel. That's not me. Well You're not right. Not literally. But yes. in what ways do you fall into those same things? And tracks? that's a that's an important thing, is that it 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 is my experience that uh, I've yet to meet someone I know they exist wolves in sheep's clothing I've yet to meet someone in a that I have had fellowship with where it is an intentional mal abuse of scripture uh, most people honest mistakes or misinterpretations or different views come from the desire to have everything apply and like you just said was an excellent point it Although he is talking about a specific people group, it isn't that you can't take the lesson and apply it to your life. And and I think that's where the disconnect happens because it's just like, oh, no, that, that's all encompassing. It's for everybody. It's No, it, it's actually to somebody, although it still applies to you. You, you can take the lesson and apply it to your life, but it doesn't mean that the promise per se was directly to him. So, um, I mean... See, we got done. We got done early. I, I, as much as I would love to go into eleven, I will not do it. Um, but there is great, great news for Israel in chapter eleven. Wonderful news in chapter eleven, and um, and and also in chapter eleven, as as my view holds that it pertains mostly to Israel, the the future glorification that will be through the chosen people of Israel. It does not mean that Gentiles will not also partake in those blessings. However, I want no part of having to make that decision during that time period. I, I'm perfectly content being in the church right now, and I won't have to I won't have to worry about hoping that I can latch on at a specific time in the future. Um, and there's many, many Jews today that are coming to faith in Jesus and, and becoming members of the church, and it's a wonderful thing. Um, and and we just I continue to pray that more and more that the you know They'll take the scales off their own eyes. They'll, they'll just let their heart, the, that the head apprehension will move to the heart appropriation. and and uh, But ultimately, that's a decision that they will have to make, as we've seen that they are responsible for that. So, um, yeah. Well, 45 minutes. You know, I said I had it knocked down, so. History finds a way to repeat itself. And as I've been spending a lot of time in the Old Testament, um, Lately, uh, I find that the actions of the Israelites uh, throughout time, they come to God, they fall away, they come to God, they fall away, they come to God, they fall away. You know, their their falling away is always in search of something to fulfill their needs, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and their fleshly needs. And, you know, us, you know, as Christians, we are no different. And I, I'm starting to see the relevance between the Israelites and us Christians. And the only difference between us and them is that we, you know, understand Christ and we do understand that we've been washed, you know, from our sinful nature. However, the catch-22 is obedience, trust, and faithfulness. Because if you lose any of those, you're walking on dangerous territory. So, you know, that's, that's our mercy also. You know, you got to follow that with obedience and trust. And their time and their uh, uh, judges that were sent, they would falter and and he would, they would be punished. Then he would send a savior temporarily, a judge, get them back in line again. And uh, but the end result was after a couple generations they would falter again. Now we look at as you said, 
as Gentiles in the same thing. Look at what happened in the past here. That now this new generation takes in and they fall by the side again. And uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's a, a, a cycle. How hard is it going to be to pick up this generation that we're talking about right now? It's because, man, <laughs> man, they, you know, myself, I had other, you know, I developed into the internet and we know the problems that came with that. Uh, but however, people are so lost in their depraved minds now that how, how are we going to pick those people? Well, they're in the churches. They're they're preaching in churches, you know. With, uh, you know, if you've been seeing the news articles or whatever, been in Christian platforms, you see what's taking place in these churches. The same things that's being taking place in the schools, you know. And it's I don't really want to point all that out because we're live right now, and other people are watching. But some of the things that are being taking place in schools, you know, not per se in Indiana. It's the same thing as being held in churches. Mm -hmm. How that's gonna that's gonna be hard. It's gonna be hard to combat that. So well, I, as we as we have heard from um, uh, Grogu, when you study uh, the end times, you know that there's going to be a falling away. Yeah, this falling away. Great apostasy. This, yeah. this falling away is not less falling away, but running away, exactly. running away as fast as you can to the evil in your depraved mind. This falling away is, this is something that, I don't know, it's the generation after this, how hard, you know, if there is a generation after this one, wow, you know. What, what you've been talking about also reminds me of um, uh, the 11th chapter of Hebrews, where there's, mm. a, there's a telling of, you know, by faith, Abraham, by faith, mm -hmm. we have that whole faith chapter, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. But um, there's a really good history, you know, mm -hmm. of by faith all these things happen. But then the bottom line is the beginning of uh, chapter 12 where it says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to throw off everything that hinders. Yeah. And the sin that so easily entangles and run with pers perseverance. And then the key thing is to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Because it's Jesus that we yeah. need to focus on. Yeah. Amen. That's like whenever you struggle throughout the day, you know, uh, in marital issues or an issue from a child at school or an issue from work, you know, often we don't, you know, so often we're so, it's so succumbed by that issue that we don't think of our shepherd first. And that's, uh, if we don't think of him first, we end up going down a dark path for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Zach, last week there was a scenario brought up about, I think she brought it up, I can't remember her name, I'm sorry. Um, Bonnie? Bonnie, yes. Bonnie brought She's up. putting you on the spot, Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a scenario, we didn't really get to talk about that quickly. It was about, like, did God know about a shooting and why didn't he stop it? Mm. So I'd like you to give a one minute. Uh, there you go. Yeah, I don't know if I can do that in one minute. <laughs> uh, I believe. You got seven, then. Yeah, my, so, yeah, yeah so God... The Bible teaches that God is, is all-knowing. And so then the direct answer that I would hold to that question is that he absolutely knows and has known from all eternity what was always going to happen. And I think the key thing to remember is, is that any time you have a view, okay, or, or you hold to a certain theology or doctrine, if that view, that doctrine does not stay consistent and it al and aligns with other doctrines because there's not one doctrine there, there's 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 different things okay if your christology what you believe about jesus doesn't match up with what you believe about the trinity you have a problem and god is all-knowing and god is infinite and he's eternal and he's good and if any view whether it's in times whether it's again the trinity whether it's whatever does not if it violates who God is as a person, then then it's a problem. And personally, in terms of God's omniscience, um, Him being all knowing, and then His omniscience, which is His wisdom, His all wise, He He knows the best possible way to get the best outcome. 
And although we don't view this world as the best world, God uses, as Romans 28 promises, all things. So he knows the way to get the best possible outcome because of his wisdom. He knew it was always going to happen. But for me, I don't want a God. If, there's, if God is a God who didn't know that that was going to happen, and therefore, apparently, if he didn't know it, it means he's not all-knowing, which means he's limited, which means he can't be all-powerful, which means he can't stop it or he would have done it because he didn't know it was going to happen. How can I trust that God to save me? And I want no part of it. If I want a God who knew that was going to happen, has already handled it judicially by sending his son, and by the way, did that from all eternity was always the plan, and will be able to save me in the, in the future. And uh, because God, we are in time, God is outside of time. Uh, he's present, and he can act in it, but he, he created time. He is not subject to temporal temporal. Time. Yeah. I have another question. When Judgment Day comes, mm-hmm. will he punish those that you know that had done something like kill somebody but was never caught? He he, he knows. Will he yes. ju- judge them and do punish them for what they've done? Everyone reaps what they sow. In, in, in my heart, I, I feel that he does. He absolutely will. That's what the Bible teaches. And you know, the other, it's a wonderful blessing because you know, as Sam talked about justice this morning. And, and Sam said it in a different way than I would. So I think he is just all the time. Even for you and me, he's just. Uh, we are getting exactly, I mean, he's merciful, praise God, that we, you know, we deserve death. The sin leads to death. But at the same time, he is just. Why? Because his son's blood washed over you and me. And to deny that would be to deny himself. So in that and of itself is justice. But people... So if, if the people murdering people accept Christ, their justice will be in eternity with Christ because they took the blood that is the only thing that can wash what they did away. And while there's different um, varying degrees of sin, and that's true, that, that not all sin is equal. All sin is equal in the sense that it only takes one to take you to hell. To, to leave you eternally separated from Christ. That's, that, is, that is what is the same about sin. But there are certain sins that are, I mean, a, a non-believer or a believer murdering a non-believer, why is it still a sin? Because everybody was made in the image of God, believer or unbeliever. And so, uh, but yeah, he, everyone's going to reap what they sow one way or another, whether eternity with him or... Eternally separated in the book from him. Of Revelation, you see all these judgments, and uh, you know, are we under judgment now? Sure, feels like it. But uh, you know, don't forget, in you know, all these judgments, who he's calling out. You know, repent, you adulterers, and you murderers, repent. So yes, we'll be walking amongst murderers, absolutely, if they repented. And uh, you know, I keep hearing about. I think it was Jeffrey Dahmer went to heaven before Mother Teresa. You know what I mean? It's because one was for good works and one did a lot of bad things and repented. You know, and uh, I don't know if I'm using that analogy or that quote right, but I do believe it was those two people. And we can't forget about who he's calling to repent. The worst of the worst. And, uh, you know, it's... That's a good point. Mercy. I mean, he used some of the worst of the worst. Paul. Paul. He, Paul. <laughs> Paul. Yeah, Moses, Moses, Paul. David. Yeah, they all got the minute that, that Janice mentioned that Hebrews chapter 11, go read the Hall of Faith. Samson's in there. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of people in there that you thought, uh, you know. Culture, for sure. I mean. If a Jew came in and murdered my whole family today and then came to me two months down the road to give me the gospel, I mean, and you know how I feel about that. <laughs> You know, just and so the the worst of the worst right now are coming out of this too. So they might be coming out of it in prison cell and finding Jesus there, but they're still coming. They're yeah. Still coming. I think I think Sam said it, and I couldn't agree more that there'll be a lot of people in heaven that if it were up to you, they probably wouldn't be there. But there's probably going to be also a lot of people that aren't in heaven that you thought should have been there. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, we all fall into that one of those two categories as well to somebody else. We so. have to understand the gospel. Yep. Well, uh, we are. As we have that vision, yes. 
They should have. Mm. There's only one company that make that decision. <coughs> valuation. That's nothing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> because maybe they, how can I say this, kind of repented, but they jumped through the escape hatch at the end. Now, was that sincere? I'm not really sure. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And thank God we don't have to make that choice. Yeah. yeah. There's different awards. Obviously, yeah. there's different reward systems. You know, and the prophets talk about how the new age will be. And sometimes, you know, it's hard for me to distinguish, you know, if they were talking, you know, 400 years into their time or if they were talking about the end of time. But I think some of it's very clear about the reward systems and about how the, the uh, life to come will be. So you see that reward system in the prophets as well. And I know that I want to be the church of Philadelphia that I work every day and try to be that. Hopefully I don't fall short, but uh, you know, I I want to my reward system obviously to be full of blessings. So I just try to focus on myself every day. And the biggest thing that makes me stumble are the people you know at work that uh, are just using GD all day or at this at that or you know or they're just stone cold hearted people. I almost got injured by one the other day, and I asked them you know very calmly if it would be fair that I wasn't able to come to work and feed my family. Of his reckless actions, and I was fair to judge by asking. I wasn't putting him down, and he had told me, "Well, you know," I said, "Would you? Would you? How would you feel? I mean, would you feel like buying my family, you know, thirty dollars worth of groceries that day or that week?" And he, his response was, "You would want me to take care of you because of an accident," and that was <laughs> it was like, "Wow, you know, was, you know, he sounds like a John Wayne movie, you know." And <laughs> it's uh. You know, so those pe that's what makes me stumble a lot, are those people. And how foolish would I feel going to work tomorrow realizing and, and, and seeing that guy transform? And mm -hmm. maybe he came to Christ this weekend, I don't know. So it's just one of the things, it's the hardest thing to swallow sometimes, are those, it's, are those people. And obviously, um, I won't be at the Church of Philadelphia if I continue to let that harden my heart. So that's a week. Hard to deal with. It's hard to deal with the pigs. It's hard to deal with the dogs. The Bible and throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament refers to ungodly people as beasts, as animals. So it's kind of hard to uh, to deal with those animals sometimes. <laughs> Knowing that I was one myself just two years ago. <laughs> well, let me. Uh, I'll close this and then we'll. I'll hit stop here. Uh, Father, just. Man, again, just so thankful for the opportunity to be here, Lord, uh, in your presence, surrounded by brothers and sisters and you. And uh, we love you, and we're so thankful for your word. And, uh, it's active and alive, Lord, and, and, and your gospel. The gospel, Lord, is just, whether you've been a believer for 50 years or you've been one for five minutes, uh, the love. And your son Jesus is just, uh, it's hard its hard to put to words. And uh, we just love you so much. And we thank you. And I pray, Lord, for this group that as they go out into the week, Lord, that they would be in, uh, energized, invigorated, Lord, to share the gospel and to be ready any and every moment to witness to people. And if not with words, with action. And uh, we love you. We thank you. It's in your son's precious name that I pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, Zach.